What I'd like to share is simply, well, it, it comes from this Tale of Two Cities by Dickens, the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. I, I find that the restoration tells a story and the Book of Mormon tells a story too, but the two differ just about as much as Dickens' words. You know, we receive a ton of good email and now and then we receive email from people who are really frustrated with us. And I, I don't mean to speak down, but my point and our point has been, I just want to teach what the Book of Mormon teaches. And if that rubs against traditions that we hold, well, you're going to have to decide if one or the other is true or if they're both false, you know. But in this case, we're going to find things that aren't true in our beliefs as far as the restoration, RLDS restoration beliefs that the Book of Mormon teaches differently. And I want to start holding on to those instead. Welcome back to Restored Gospel Podcast. It's a first, it's a special, it's a festival this morning of all three original members here. Shane, welcome. Corey, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Corey coined a phrase. We've been looking at Mormonism. The Book of Mormon is not Mormonism. Looking at the doctrine of the Book of Mormon, what it teaches. And we uh, ended on our last episode saying we might look at a tale of two cities. Corey, why don't you expound on that? Uh, yeah, so I, if you're sharing my screen, uh, <clears throat> it's going to be a takeoff on that, but it's a tale of two Zions. And what I'd like to share is simply, well, it, it comes from this tale of two cities by Dickens. The best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. And that's how Dickens begins his book, Tale of Two Cities. Of, of course, those cities were London and Paris and back during the times of the revolution and the, the similarities and the contrast between the two. Um, this podcast doesn't have anything to do with the book, but borrowing from the idea that there are great contrasts that have existed through time, what I've realized, and I think what we've realized through our discussions together is that this great story of Zion that we talk about is one of these great contrasts. And coming to truth means sometimes recognizing what our traditions and versus what our truths so what I'd like to do in, in just kind of our conversation is sort of talk about what this Zion is as far as, you know, this restoration belief that's been since the 1830s or 40s, and then look at what the Book of Mormon teaches about it, and then try to figure out what where the truth is in this. Um, um, there is a paradigm created within the restoration. I'll, I'll say that up front. And if you only hold to the paradigm what and by paradigm i just mean the the view that we have of the restoration version of zion um this could sound initially confusing but um i don't know what what do you guys think of when you hear the word zion what is i mean you know it's, it's thrown around the restoration but what does that mean to you yeah uh well i'm here i'm here because of zion i say here i mean Cottage Street, Independence, Missouri, uh, just a few blocks from what we call the Temple Lot. From the yeah, you can pretty much see it from your house, right? Yeah, the RLDS or Community of Christ Temple, our uh, LDS Visitor Center, um, and why I, I came from Ohio, the land of the Ohio, uh, gathered here because if if I looked back at my childhood, I think the number one message the number one hope overreaching message of our one true church was that we were going to build zion in independence missouri and i had grandparents that lived here so we'd travel out for world conference but that i mean looking back that was the number one 
takeaway so much so that we knew when we got to be adults that we would all gather to zion at some point in time uh so yeah for for me you know i think it was um it it was really a, a centerpiece of our doctrine you know it that we would all be in this physical one place together um you know of course living righteously and all that all things common it would just become that was like our goal that was the centerpiece it was the theme of our reunions and you know uh, sermon series based on it um you know i know one of the elements of it of the gathering in zion was also like having a storehouse you know and so people would you know people have large amounts of food and all that kind of saved up for for this you know the cataclysm that's going to occur and Zion is going to be our safety. You know, it's going to be the only way we're going to escape any of it. And, um, growing up, it seemed like that was, that was really the center of our doctrine was, was Zion building the city, becoming one m- more so than Jesus in my, in my mind. But I reached out to a, a LDS a friend, uh, Matt Shane, you know, Matt Lurkey, I mm-hmm. uh, reached out to him and asked him last night, what, what was the um, emphasis on Zion in the LDS circles? And basically he said, it wasn't, it, it, it's not, it's uh, Zion is where the saints are gathered. Um, I believe he told me they had something. Uh, one of their people said it would be in the Rocky Mountains out west. Uh, certainly not the emphasis that we've had in the RLDS side of, of a holy city, Zion. I, I've, I've known a handful of people growing up who took all of their goods, their monies and, and properties and put them all into a common, uh, trying to have a common, uh, you know, all things common. And people ended up losing losing everything and different people took over stuff and it wasn't it didn't end up being a a christ-like endeavor in the end it was just still sinful people that were way in over their heads trying to follow certain i think doctrines that we've come to believe in were were propagated through the years and so i've seen those experiments fail too through the years right yeah what about you Corey? you're you're from that that beautiful state up north of Ohio, Michigan. <laughs> How'd you end up in at least some of Missouri? Same way. I just felt, you know, the scriptures or, well, let me not say so much the scriptures. People around me had emphasized that, you know, we we're going to have to gather to independence for safety. And when I had my chance, I kind of let go of everything else going on in life. I, I mean, I was a grad student, almost done with the graduate program at the time and felt like, oh, I needed to leave then for urgency. That was you know, over, that was 40 years ago now, but, um, this whole idea of Zion just sort of dominated my thinking too. And, and it was really defined by scriptures that we in the, like you mentioned, the LDS doesn't emphasize it so much. They don't emphasize independence, Missouri. Um, you know, Hey, they've got a, a great visitor center here. I'm sure they would love to own the temple lot just because they own so many, but, um, that would just be a feather in their cap, not really a thing of righteousness. But when you look back on our church history, after the split at Nauvoo, people who stayed with Brigham, you know, they took the values of Nauvoo and they emphasized those things. It began began with building temples and then baptism for the dead and all these things became symbols of righteousness to them. The people who rejected that stuck more with Emma and then they dialed the clock back to the Kirtland era, which w- is where we really get these ideas that, oh, we have to gather to independence. So while we, we think that this concept of Zion is prevailing through the restoration, it's, it's really not. It's, it's more in the local RLDS oh. restoration. And so I take that into consideration sharing this, that these ideas aren't universal. But what dictated it to to me and perhaps us was also the story we get about Enoch and Enoch city, which came, I don't know, it came, I guess, into the doctrine and covenants. And and then when the inspired version was written and that was after Joseph's life, that was rewritten into there as if it was the original text of the Hebrew old Testament. It is not. Um, I have a little bit to say about that today and I don't want to get too deep into that, but it's important as far as the story goes of comparing what the Book of Mormon teaches and what it doesn't teach. Yeah. Because, yeah, go ahead. I don't, if I get you off, tell me. We'll talk about it later. If it's, uh, oh, if go ahead. it's I'm, I'm just glad we're talking here. Yeah, I wanted to bring up, uh, bring everybody together as far as RLDS, LDS. There is uh, 
revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants. It's RLDS section 83. Uh, uh, I'm not sure in the LDS where Joseph dedicates a spot in Independence, Missouri. This was after, I think, their, uh, what they call it, Zion's camp or their failed mission to bring the saints back. Um, they stopped in Independence on their way back to Kirtland. And I believe it says something like the, the beginning of the gathering of Zion will begin at the temple lot uh, not far west from the courthouse. And if you stand on the temple lot in Independence and look eastward, uh, you could, I think the old courthouse is still there, the, <clears throat> uh, but, but the, the new courthouse, there's a new courthouse there as well, but that was the spot Joseph put some cornerstones down for the temple. And those cornerstones are there, uh, in the temple lot still it's owned by the church of Jesus Christ. Um, I guess we call them temple lot or Hedricites. Right. Uh, um, they own that little piece of land. There's a church there, but we both had, we, we all had that revelation before the church split. That so there is whether it's emphasized or not, it is in our scriptures that definitely the gathering in Zion would begin there and then move move out, uh, spread out from there. And so that's another concept when we're talking about Zion. I think it's just as important, or it's completely meshed together, is gathering. Uh, and that's that's what I heard. You know, when are you going to gather? We still have saints moving to this area from all parts of the country as part of the gathering to gather together i think so it will be protected and and be a force as the world gets worse uh and i hope at some point i think shane and i were researching the gathering we saw some little some little switches in the bible uh in joseph smith's translation where it it changes the timeline of that and i think maybe we haven't been correct in that and that's important to look at too yeah exactly this everything became so self-centered and it wasn't supposed to be, you know, this doc, this book of Mormon came to us because Gentiles were stumbling in doctrine. God in his mercy says, here's the doctrine, straight, simple, plain. Mm -hmm. And somehow we lost track of that and made the story about ourselves. So in my view of this, uh, I, I could be wrong, but it seems that the emphasis on gathering has been among us Gentiles as if the Gentiles commission is to gather and build this city of Zion. That's, you know, you go to any of the conservative restoration branches and that's kind of what makes them conservative is they're keeping this, this story alive of it's our commission to build Zion and that's why we are gathered. But um, when There's you study a, the Book sorry, of Mormon, I was just gonna say you study the Book of Mormon and it's not about the gathering of Gentiles, it's the gathering of the house of Israel. And, and we are the Gentiles that the Book of Mormon came to. We're, we're not Israel. No, e even though some people say, oh, aren't we Ephraim? You know, they, they draw some loose scriptures together in that. If we were the house of Joseph and the Book of Mormon came to us, then the whole storyline of the Book of Mormon is wrong because the Book of Mormon returns to Gentiles. That was us. And so the gathering is truly supposed to be of Israel, not of Gentiles who assume they're Israel. Yeah, the message of gathering early on. Shane, maybe you can help me out. Uh, there was uh, two journals that of, of early missionaries that went to the East Coast. Uh, but I don't remember if they went from Kirtland or Nauvoo. Um, but they kept their diary, and I, I can't remember the men's names, but we would know them if we brought them up. But in their journals, as they went to, I, would, I want to say preach the gospel, but what they recorded in their journals and how they measured their success was, uh, you know, talk to several families today. We think two of them are going to gather. We think three of them are going to gather. It, it was a, success, a successful trip. We've got several that are going to be gathering. And it wasn't, you know, you know, we had 100 people accept Jesus and, and make their covenant or anything like that. It was all about gathering. And, and their article they put in the paper in 1830, the covenant they made that they were going to the Lamanites to teach them the gospel and also the doctrine of gathering and the temple in Zion as early as 1830. So this was the, this was kind of the message that it, this is what became a message gathered together and Zion is right around the corner. Yeah. I think there's a couple things too, to, to, that, to tie into that. And that was sort of the, the attractiveness of it. I mean, they were being persecuted. They were being kind of run out as, you know, kind of weirdos and, you know, out of these different places. So, I mean, being able to say, Hey, God wants us to all gather in this one place, you know, and it's, it'll be a place of safety. And I mean, they thought Zion was going to happen in their lifetimes. Yeah. And so here they are being persecuted and all that. It's like, it, that's a wonderful idea of having a city of just fellow believers. I mean, what a great idea. 
you know? So I think that was a motivator in that, in that preaching. Cause you know, you, they could go, you go to any, um, you know, Christian church and hear about Jesus, but hearing about this more specific you know, kind of mystery kind of a thing, it was more attractive. I think yeah. it's good to point out too, uh, you know, as they went on that mission to the Lamanites, they ended up in Ohio and met a, a man named Sidney Rigdon with a large congregation. And this idea of, of coming together and gathering together and having all things common didn't start with Joseph and his revelations, but rather there was a group of people there already living together, I believe on the Morley farm or, or um, in the area yeah. around there. So it's interesting as these people came and joined the church that soon the focus became the main focus was gather together, live all things common, you know? Yeah. And we accept that story because we've been telling it for so long. And I suppose this saying by Hitler could be applied in many cases, but he stated tell a lie once and it remains a lie, tell a lie a thousand times and it becomes the truth. And, and so we've grown up with, our great grandparents' generations all talking about gathering. So why shouldn't we believe it? But again, it goes back to this era that they, they got some things wrong incorrectly. And I, I gathered too. And I, and I emphasize the importance of that to my kids. And, and I, I just think the book of Mormon tells a, a bigger story. And in fact, just to nip that in the bud, one of the ideas of Zion that was promoted to me was that it was going to be the only place of safety. And that's where, Literally all the saints, or if you're a good saint, anyhow, we're going to be gathered to, to this place. And, you know, we, we even named it by name, Independence, Missouri. But the Book of Mormon says something totally different. It talks about a day when there's two churches across the face of the earth, and it doesn't really name them by name, and not that you could, but it's basically the ones who fight against Jesus and the ones who fight for Jesus. But it states that the dominion of the church against Jesus was large, but the dominion of the believers was small, but they were across the whole face of the earth as well. And that's an important point just to bring up is that, you know, my gosh, if if the Book of Mormon is true, it doesn't seem to indicate that all the believers were holed up in one place of safety with their canned goods, you know, while the rest of the world went downhill. The believers in Christ were throughout the whole earth as well. And I mean, that's just one little point the Book of Mormon makes. But when you consider it in context of what we're, we're teaching, here's the tale of two cities, right? You know, it's a, it's a big difference. I don't know if you've considered that or have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I was going to say it, it, what you said you know, at the beginning there was is spot on. It's, it's almost like it's fear based. You know, it's. I know in Joseph's day, it was more about, you know, gather here and, and be safe. And for those of us today, especially in the, with the RLDS background, it's more about stay here and wait, you know, yeah. and, and don't leave. I, you know, I grew up, uh, unlike you guys, I didn't ever gathered. I grew up in the independence area. And so that was kind of, that was home, but we considered ourselves gathered. And uh, here about a decade ago, I got a, a promotion at my job and they wanted me to move away from Kansas city. And, man, I fought that. I mean, it was so hard, you know, and, and I begin, you know, because my psyche tells me if I, if you leave, you're ungathering, you're, you're willingly choosing to leave this place of safety, you know? And, and, and of I've, course the bad thing that we all know is about to happen is going to happen right when you left. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, and I, you know, I, I know, and this is an extreme example, but, and I don't want to embarrass a person, but I know a person that believes that they won't even go on vacation. Uh -huh. you know, because they don't want to be, you know, gone, you know, on an Island somewhere or whatever. And Zion comes while they're gone and they miss yeah. it, Yeah, you know, and it's just a, it's a fear based sort of psychological thing, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I go back to the book of Mormon and it's like, okay, so how do you reconcile this? If, if we're teaching that everyone's gathered into one spot, but the book of Mormon teaches that, and, and I don't know, maybe we should bring that scripture up. It's in uh, second Nephi 11. I believe that, um, okay, I got the but, Ethan one pulled up right now, but um, yeah, or we can get it in a little bit. I think I've got it in my notes. Okay, well, let but, me say this, and, and we don't have to get into it too far. But I, as most things, it's not a. There's slight deceptions I think that keep us from experiencing God in more powerful ways. Uh, Corey, you were recently teaching at a congregation, and one of the comments kind of said, well, what's the difference between, you know, Jesus coming and Zion and being excited about those, you know, they're kind of the same thing. 
And I want to say there's nothing on the surface that seems bad or wrong. I'm, I'm very happy I moved here because I go to, you know, I went from a congregation of just a handful of people to when I first moved experiencing uh, older youth gatherings of, you know, 60, 70, 80 people on Wednesday nights after prayer service, we'd get together and we'd have fellowship and learning and study. And those relationships I, I made, I still go to church with some of those people today, 20 years later. I like being in a place where there's other saints. I think there's a benefits to it uh, on the surface. It's nothing wrong with that. It it's probably has a lot of advantages, but I think that, the major thing is, is if, if it takes all of our time and energy or a significant amount of our time and energy figuring out how to build something or how to establish an organization or how to have something, that's time that needs to be spent in other areas like learning, how do I deny myself of ungodliness? How do, how do I fall into that category of I'm exercising my faith unto repentance to the best of my ability so I can be uh, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and be in his kingdom in eternity. I mean, those are things that that I wish that would have been my childhood message that was undeniable that if someone said, what'd you learn growing up? I learned that Jesus Christ is going to save me and bring me home. If I do, if I <laughs> work the program, if I try and desire to come to him and allow him to do that. I mean, that's the message, right? But it was, that's not the over overreaching topic that most of us grew up with. No, it's not at all. And, you know, I, you look back on our history and it's like, okay, so early by 1830s, people were already talking about gathering the independence. And, and those reasons are a little bit nebulous. There's some scripture that was taken, I believe, out of context or more appropriately just misunderstood that caused people to have this extreme urgency. Um, and when you look at what the Book of Mormon teaches versus what we did, you know, you can't reconcile the two. But but, you, you know, you look at when God commanded in the war chapters of the Book of Mormon, you know, by, by prophecy, the armies were led to go someplace or not go someplace. And, and all those things always happened according to God's word. And then you look at our people and we believe, well, it's the same God leading us. And, well, gathered independence, you know, you're going to build this city of Zion. And then they're, you know, I don't know if it's like in football where the person stiff arms you really quick or if it's in basketball and the person rejects your shot, you know, you got the easy layup and he slams it out the ball away. That's what happened to the Saints. They got totally rejected. And it's like, do we do we look at that honestly? Do we do we back up and say, but wait, I thought God, the father of all heaven and earth was the one who told us we were going to be successful in this. And we weren't. And then and then we kind of back pedal the story a little bit and say, oh, well, God needed to test us. You know, we weren't all faithful. This is only for the faithful. And then you start introducing these ideas of the more righteous are going to have the higher degrees of salvation. So it's only for the celestial. And, you know, and then you start hearing the stories like the ring of fire story. You know, that was part of my Zion growing up that I had to get to independence because there was this ring of fire that was going to be around it. And if you you weren't good enough, you couldn't come in, but you got to get in good before the doors shut. You know, this this urgency and this, this yeah. fight along with it, you know, it's all part of the story, I guess. Did Alfred, you guys Alfred, have the ring of fire thing? The Alfred White story? Alfred White, right. Infallible proofs, the story, the three the zones of righteousness, I guess, or, or yeah. the, the circles of. Yeah. But yeah. you know, that's, that's like <clears throat> everyday staple at the restoration branches all around is that, you know, this, this is what creates the urgency for us. You know, and, and so these pictures in our mind become the story that we've told over and over and over, and it's become the truth. But all I say is, hey, well, what does the Book of Mormon really have to say about this? And so... Um, i got Nephi pulled up if you want to... Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, you we'll... You know what? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. we'll get to Nephi in here yeah. in a second. There's, there's really, and I've already stated it, but the Book of Mormon teaches a different story about Zion than is taught by the Restoration. And I know that's a difficult fact for some people to accept you know we receive a ton of good email and now and then we receive email from people who are really frustrated with us and i i don't mean to speak down but my point and our point has been i just want to teach what the book of mormon teaches and if that rubs against traditions that we hold well you're going to have to decide if one or the other is true or if they're both false you know but in this case, we're going to find things that aren't true in our beliefs as far as the restoration, RLDS restoration beliefs. 
that the Book of Mormon teaches differently. And I want to start holding on to those instead. I think this is also important, especially you look at what's going on in Israel right now. There's going to be things happening in the last days. Uh, and if the saints or believers see things play out differently than what perhaps they thought the story was, I can only imagine the the faith crisis, the the you know the the temptation to disbelieve everything. Your your, your whole religion and foundation shatters if things end up playing out in prophecy uh, differently than what we've been taught through our culture. And maybe according to what the Book of Mormon says, I think it's important to understand what God's plan is. So we're not surprised. So we don't think he's, you know, things have gotten off track. And where is our Lord? You know, he's forsaken us. That that kind of, and I could see that happening, you know, whether in my exactly. lifetime or my children's lifetime. And, and Satan rejoices in that because it frustrates the saints. They get despondent. They move away. They don't want anything to do with the, the scriptures. And the truth is still in the scriptures. You know, but we just can't have a narrow view of it and in, in, in a view of our own making. Well, that's well, think about that, Corey. Think about our children right now that grew up with this 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 understanding of Zion, and all they've seen is the church bicker and fight and fall apart and get smaller and smaller. And they start to think that the the prophecies aren't being fulfilled, and this is just all a bunch of of silliness. Yeah. But if they knew the real story, or if it was promoted in the Book of Mormon, then those feelings wouldn't be there of failure. Imagine if you were a, a, a 12 or a 13 year old boy uh, in in the in 1830 when Joseph Smith gave that revelation where he said that uh, in 56 years Zion would be redeemed. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you live your whole life. Now you're 70 something years old and nothing's happened. How, what yeah. would that do? What would that do to your faith, your walk yeah. with God? You know exactly, and in parallel to that, you have now Joseph Smith Sr., the first appointed patriarch, giving out over 300 patriarchal blessings, many of them using this phrase, You are going to live to see Christ on the earth. You are going to see, he liked the phrase, the winding up scene, you know, the last days. It's all happening, you're going to live through it. Um, all these people were told that, that, and and they're all dead. I mean, I hate to be blunt, but that. We, we've set ourselves up for great disappointment because we started making the story about ourselves and we started prophesying what we thought were true words. And, and unfortunately, I don't think they were. That's an important point. We should just probably straight out say it. There, there's, there's no doubt. There's tons of evidence that Joseph Smith Jr., you know, if, if you think he's a prophet or if he's held up as a prophet, um, he thought Zion was right around the corner. Like it was imminent. It was coming. I don't know how someone who has, is a prophet or has prophetic leadership, um, is, has the timeline off. Can you imagine if, if Isaiah was wrong about Jesus? I mean, it's oh, just, yeah. it, it was, it was in the culture. There's, there's just no doubt about it. They thought it was imminent. It was right around the corner. And to me that that's something to tuck away and say, well, maybe I need to, sit on that a while as far as my idolatry of joseph smith and him being a prophet and everything he says goes because was he really prophetic after the book of mormon and and i'm not trying to to slam him or anything but we've got to be honest in our thinking i mean things did not happen that they said and they were preaching were going to happen yeah so yeah i think the the word that you use there idolatry i mean it, it that's just really the honest truth. You know, I've had a lot of conversations with people that, you know, don't agree with, with me and that's fine. Um, and, but the, the common, like we'll, we'll compare, we'll compare notes, you know, I'll use the scriptures and compare it to their, to our traditions. And the, the final response is always, well, I don't understand it, but I trust Joseph. So it's, I, it's must, I must not just understand, you know, and, and it's going to come to pass. And, and I mean, that's idolatry. It really, I mean, if, if, if the Lord says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. But if Joe Smith says he's going to do something, he's just a man like the rest of us. We all make mistakes, you know? Yeah. But there's somehow power in number and you get to a congregation that has a few more people and you get a few more people saying that. And then you think, okay, here's our strength. You know, we're, we're all committed to Joseph Smith. We're all going to write whatever he said on our hearts and on the walls of our church and all these things. And it's like, I would say come back to the Book of Mormon first and, and make your decisions based on that first. And 
you know, if things agree, great. But if things disagree, you're going to have to consider what came first. And it was the Book of Mormon. I, I was reading this morning and these words kind of jumped out at me. This, um, this idea that Joseph, uh, I'm sorry, Jacob, rather, in the Book of Mormon, uh, I guess I don't have the reference here in the RLDS. It's like Jacob chapter four. It's right after the parable of the olive tree. And he says, you know, while his arm of mercy is extended toward us, harden not your hearts. Yea, today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts for why will you die? For behold, after that you have been nourished by the good word of God all the day long, will you bring forth evil fruit that you must be hewn down and cast into the fire? Behold, will you reject these words? Will you reject the words of the prophets? And will you reject the words which have been spoken concerning Christ after that so many have spoken concerning him and deny the good word of Christ and the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost and quench the Holy Spirit and make a mock of the great plan of redemption which hath been laid for you? Now, he says a whole lot there. What I want to bring out is don't, don't harden your hearts against the word. He's, he's using this in context of this parable of Zenos, the parable of the olive tree that he's just explained. And, and he fears people are going to reject his explanation of it. Um, part of that explanation, he even refers to back, you know, after you've been nourished by the good word of God all the day long, will you bring forth evil fruit? That's a pretty good parallelism to the whole story of, the parable of the olive tree in that you know the trees brought forth good fruit but then they brought forth evil fruit or fruit that didn't taste good and <clears throat> when the wild branches are grafted in they're producing all kinds of fruit and none of it's good well those wild branches were representing the gentiles us uh, not the house of israel and <clears throat> while at first they brought forth good fruit eventually when he goes back to the vineyard None of them produce any good fruit. And he says, these trees aren't worth anything. What are we going to do? They end up cutting down, cutting off those branches that were the evil fruit, or, or in other words, the wild branches. The, and, and they return to, finally to the good fruit, which I think is just a, the story's way of saying, God set up his church among the house of Israel, and there were times when they followed it beautifully, and they had... Christ in their midst, but the Gentiles, us, you know, we had the right to come to a covenant with Jesus just as much as the Jews. It had really nothing to do with lineage, our covenant, but the traditions we brought in, I mean, you look at every Gentile group. I mean, if, if I could speak to the Pope, I would say, hey, you know, the problem is with the Catholic Church, you got too many traditions of men. If I could speak to the Muslims, I'd say, you know what your problem is? You got too many traditions of men. If I could speak to the Buddhists, the Hindus, you know, if, if I could speak to the evangelicals of our day, believe it or not, they've got too many traditions. These, this church rapture idea, you know, it's, it's not scriptural. It was someone's dream. But the, the, where it comes close to home is that we too, we as the restoration, you know, you look at the LDS group, my gosh, there's full of traditions that they think are truth. Uh, you know, whether it's temple baptisms and all these endowments, or you look at the RLDS group and we think we're right. And yet, what do we have? We have too many traditions. Well, all these traditions have corrupted our view of Christ. They've transfigured the word of God. They've changed the gospel to where we don't recognize it. And we get angry at it now because of these, these ideas of men, or it may have been your mom, you know, rocking you to sleep at night, telling you these stories that she had been told. And it's like, if we can't separate the story from the truth, we're lost. That when, when the Lamanites came to Christ, the big thing they did was they let go of their false traditions and they held on to the truth and they became even more righteous than the Nephites for a time. And, and so this is, I guess I'm going a little long on this, but the point I'm going to make is just believe the word first. And that might mean letting go of traditions that we don't recognize our traditions so we can come to truth. I think a good piece of advice uh, also would, if people want to take that journey and want to experiment on the word, uh, be cognizant in your mind that you have to look at this first 
and, and kind of take away the lens of what came later as you look at the Book of Mormon and the story of Zion, because certain questions will pop up in your minds, questions that were planted there by revelations and doctrines that came after the Book of Mormon. And, and I don't know how many conversations we've had where, where we try to explain or, or show what the Book of Mormon says, and the arguments come from uh, doctrine and revelations that came later. They're using those things to argue against the Book of Mormon, and that's exactly what we have to not do. We have to set that aside as best as we can, ask God to help us pretend to look at things with fresh lenses before all of those questions crept in and, and those different ideas to honestly see what the story is and then go back and see what fits in or what doesn't fit in in later doctrine. That's very hard. It's very hard to deprogram from those things to try to see things uh, honestly for what they were intended without those ideas creeping in. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think there's a danger in that you can awaken to the lies or awaken to the false traditions, but not awaken to the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we want to be careful. We don't, you know, we don't point out all these things that, that don't fit and then become bitter and angry and, and, and walk away or fall away. Um, but rather replace it with, with, you know, waking up to the truth of God. I mean, that's really the whole point of any of this, of a sort of wake up uh, experience is that God is calling us home. God, you know, Christ is wanting us to find him. And what it's amazing to me that even in the midst of our idolatry and our, our false traditions and our, you know, all these things we've embraced and, you know, been willing to die on the hill for, even, even though it's all, you know, much of this is, is not truth, you know, that we have embraced uh, through our lives, the Lord is still right there calling us, you know, and I, I feel like, I, th I feel like if we can focus on our relationship with him, then he can, he can shine the light in the areas that need to be lit, lit up and, you know, and make us aware of, and we can reject the things that we need to reject. So that's, that's such good. That's some, so glad you pointed that out. I, I, I've lost track of how many times I've heard well-meaning people, friends, men to say, you know, people start down this path you're going, you start questioning what our beliefs are and you end up in a dark place and you reject everything. And that's just not been my experience. It's been the exact opposite. And so that's a great, a great thing you just said. Uh, what's the fruit of going back to the word. And in my life, I, right now I feel so much more free, able to love people. I don't have this pressure on me that you start to get angry because we're failing in our mission as a church and we're spending time focusing on things we shouldn't. And all of these things add up that you carry around with you and that's all gone. It's, it's just, it's been, it's born good fruit to me. So that's, that's good. You can get caught up in those things. You're right. Where you become angry. You think you've been hoodwinked or, or whatever, and you just focus on everything that went, you know, that was <laughs> misconstrued and that becomes your, your focus. And that's, that's not the good way to go. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that too, that it's important not to just point out the, the flaws, but to find the truth through it. And hopefully we can do that. You know, sharing the gospel with people, whether you'd call it, you know, a cottage meeting or in someone's home, you know, years ago, I can remember that disparity because it's like, you know, you'd start telling what the word said to people in their homes and they'd get really interested, but then they'd want to come to church and say, well, it's really not alive here. You know, <laughs> we kind of believe this stuff in theory, but we don't have it, you know, and anyhow, hopefully we can have this truth from the, from the word, you know, and again, Moroni I asked this question in the end of Mormons chapter, why have you transfigured the Holy word of God? And, and this has to be something that comes to our, the forefront of our mind. It's like, where have we maybe transfigured? figure this word. I can't claim to be an authority on this because I still see too much of this through my paradigm of the way I was taught and the way I was told. I want to understand it from what I read and have the Holy Ghost inspire from that. And so I'm, I'm working on it. But um, so the conventional story, you know, as we kind of pointed out, is God restored us his church in 1830. The restored church persists. You know, we hear that a lot, but we also get now, um, since the restoration groups formed this idea that, well, God is keeping us kind of on the wings until he sets the church in order. You know, we sort of get this idea added to it, but um, that the church is going to build this physical Zion. And then the city of Enoch, we haven't really mentioned that yet, but that returns to meet the physical. And that 
blending of Enoch City and this physical Zion begins the millennium and there's peace on earth for a thousand years. Satan's let loose. There's final judgment. And then presumed we go off to these infinite levels of salvation based on the quality and quantity of our works. There's probably more to it, but have I missed any points in this right here? I mean, is that kind of how you guys were, were taught? Yeah. Matter of fact, I, I just watched a video last night uh, on a channel called Mormon Rescue. And he pointed out that the millennium is not in the Book of Mormon. Endowments aren't in the Book of Mormon. He pointed out so many things, I think, that, and we'll be talking about some of these. Yeah, uh, I, I, that point jumped out at me, too, because I was searching the word millennium and I realized it doesn't occur as, as well as, you know, Enoch. The, the word Enoch does not occur in the Book of Mormon. Covenant with Enoch, City of Enoch, all that, none of it's in the Book of Mormon. And, and you know, you, I don't know we're taking this idea too far is, but what the Book of Mormon teaches, what it says is important, but what it doesn't say is equally important, or at least we can learn from it. And, and it should give us enough pause to just consider, okay, if it's not in the Book of Mormon, um, you know, where, how and where does this fit in or why isn't it there? And we can define this through some scripture here in a little bit, but for instance, you know, we, through the writings of Joseph Smith, have leaned on this story of Enoch to where it prevails. Uh, you know, it's it's Enoch City who is on earth that was taken to heaven, as the story goes, that's going to come back. And we need to be looking for it. And we need to be righteous because, you know, when, when the people, the saints keep all the commandments, Zion's going to come to the earth again. That's the carrot that's been on the stick. But the Book of Mormon doesn't teach any of that at all. And so... And, and and Lehi had ample time, you know, that he could have taught it, but he didn't. So I asked, well, why? Or when the plates of the Jaredites came forth, you know, right early on, um, Moroni says, the early part of the plates gave the history of the creation of the world, but that's also written in the record of the Jews. I'm going to let them tell that story, all right? He doesn't share it, although it was written in there. But what he goes on to say, and this is, what we're going to see in Ether 6, or it's Ether 13 in the LDS, is that he talks about this land when the waters receded, it was a choice land, but he never mentions that Enoch City was here. That's something we were taught growing up. You know, it's it's not mentioned. It, it's mentioned that a new Jerusalem will exist, built up by Joseph's people, the remnant of Joseph, who we aren't either. We want to be. We want to be part of the covenant. But the, But the point is that Enoch received all the attention, and instead that story of Enoch upstages all the teaching of the Book of Mormon. And, and I'll give another one here, and I'll probably repeat it as we go through some of these slides. You know, what do you think of, I'll ask it as a question first, what do you think of when someone says, hey, tell me the everlasting covenant? What comes to mind? Question for you guys. Well, I know it because of a song by a group called Brother John that I grew up listening to. Yeah. And this is my everlasting covenant that when thy posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, and then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy, and the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and shall possess the earth and shall have place until the end come. And this is my everlasting covenant which I made unto thy father Enoch. Yeah. And same story for you, Shane? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly the same. Yeah. So, and mine too. But consider this that. That everlasting covenant we were made to believe was and is the everlasting covenant. Those were words that were added by Joseph Smith that got later written in the inspired version and also in the Doctrine and Covenants. But there's no everlasting covenant with Enoch made in the Book of Mormon. It's never mentioned. And if it's so important, why? Now, I, I don't want to say, hey, if it's not in the Book of Mormon, it's not true. Like, for instance, Daniel was a prophet. He prophesied a lot about the Jews Daniel's never mentioned in the Book of Mormon, okay? You know, he came after Nephi by just a little bit. But it doesn't mean Daniel's not true. So, you know, you can kind of argue this both ways. But but here's the thing. If, if the Gentiles coming to Christ was so important, I would think that some of these prominent people who were given the opportunity to see visions to the end of day, days, they may have mentioned this, and they didn't. So everlasting covenant is actually not 
this promise made to Enoch. Now I know a lot of people in restoration are about to turn off this you this YouTube video right now because of me saying this, but hear me out. What's what's more powerful and more beautiful has nothing to do with Enoch. It's an everlasting covenant that's made with Abraham. And Abraham's covenant is mentioned in the Book of Mormon. And see, this whole idea, you can already see, got upstaged by this supposedly more powerful notion of this guy named Enoch, who's who's never mentioned. And so well, the, the Abraham covenant was twofold. One, it was going to restore Jews and Gentiles. You know, these two children of Abraham, Ishmael and Isaac, who one Ishmael becomes the head of the Arab nations. Hey, you know, here's Hamas and Palestine and all these people. And one becomes the head of the Jews. Abraham <clears throat> wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile, literally, who lived in Iraq. Came, God said, hey, I'm going to give you this land from the Nile to the Euphrates, this huge swath of land, much larger than what Israel is. It's going to be for your inheritance. <clears throat> Israel, as a nation, even 2,000 years ago, never occupied nearly all that land. It was just a piece of it. But the point is, it was part of a promise to be fulfilled someday. His promise was to restore Jews and Gentiles to be one, okay? That hasn't happened since that day. But more so, the promise was to regather Israel to the lands of their inheritance, and that's named in Ether 6 as the Old Jerusalem, and also the remnant of Joseph to whom this land, the Americas, was given, they were going to build a city, but it was going to be called the New Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, here's another point, and we talk about the Tale of Two Zions. The Book of Mormon never mentions this gathering as Zion. Believe it or not, it doesn't. It mentions a New Jerusalem, and the, I guess the distinction I want to make is we have to ask, where are these notions that we've been taught really coming from? Well, of course, Zion is in the Bible, and of course, the word Zion appears in the Book of Mormon. But the application of it specifically, I think, is important for us to understand that it only mentions New Jerusalem as, as a city. So we don't even speak in the correct context. I, I think that's something to consider. We say, hey, we're going to build Zion. Well, the technical term, to be technical, is no, there's a city, New Jerusalem, going to be built. But is it because of all of us Gentiles in our restoration branches who are somehow magically going to do this? The word doesn't say that either. Ether 6 or Ether 13 LDS teaches that it's built by the remnant of Joseph on this land, and it's for the remnant of Joseph on this land, just like the homeland of the Jews will eventually be built up to those people. And it's all after they come back to a full relationship with Jesus. It's, it's gathering the word and gathering the people <clears throat> has to be initiated by a full return to Christ. And, and you don't see that in the Jews' lives today, just a handful, but it's part of the sign. And you don't see that in the remnant people who are lost on this land yet either. But it's, it's part of what has to happen first. This is why the Book of Mormon is so important, is that it is the, or part of the catalyst, let's say, that brings them back to a full knowledge and relationship with Christ. And in all of our glorious beliefs in the Restoration, that single principle is probably the most often sidestepped. That it's really not just us talking about, hey, let's build Zion. It's what we should be talking about, I feel, is how could we get this word back to the remnant so that they can have a full relationship with Jesus Christ? And we don't talk about it because we don't have it either. Like you said, Shane, you know, this, or, or maybe Mike, it was this idea of Zion superseded a relationship with Christ that, that wasn't important to have. It was like, oh, well, we already have a relationship with Christ. Now let's build a kingdom. I don't think that's right either. Yeah, I think that's an important point you made as far as this the Abrahamic covenant. Because, you know, the reason Jerusalem is on the map is because it was built on the site where, you know, on Mount Moriah, where, where Abraham made that covenant. He was willing to offer up his son to yes. God. And, and so here's God offering up his son for us. This covenant was made right there. And that was why it was called Jerusalem. And so the new Jerusalem is another city, you know, where that same covenant is with, upheld. And now it's the new covenant where Christ was the perfect sacrifice, you know, and he offered himself up. God himself came and took, took upon flesh and offered himself up. And so it's all part of that same 
Abrahamic covenant, if we get distracted onto some other relationship, other covenant, you know, other man, other, you know, this, this thing that was, that was added, then we miss the whole point of, of all of this happening, you know? Exactly. And, and here we're this, you know, restoration church who thinks the universe is revolving around us and, and God has to wait on us somehow. And it's like, history has been marching on and God's work has been marching on and we're missing it. You know, we don't, we don't get it because first of all, we don't understand what the true everlasting covenant really is. Um, that's probably a scripture we should, we should delve into, but I still want to hit a few of these topics and, and we'll catch up with all the scriptures, you know, it's hey, before been you, go ahead. Oh, before you moved on uh, from that last slide, I just, I wanted to, I studied something last night that I think is just an interesting little tidbit in terms of tradition. So we're talking about the millennial reign of the thousand years. So the original word in Greek, um, in Revelation, which is where it talks about the thousand years, is, uh, is ch- I don't know how you pronounce it, Chilioi, C-H-I-L-I-O-I. Okay. And uh, it's G5507 in the strongest concordance, if anybody wants to look up. But that word was not a noun. It was an adjective. And what it actually means is uncertain affinity. It's not a number. And so the translators didn't know what to do with it. It was kind of an odd, obscure idea. It just meant like a lot or, you know, they didn't know what to do with it. And so they assigned it the number thousand. Mm. And so it got written at, and and it's actually, it appears over a hundred times. That's interesting. So, and so they assigned a thousand just meaning a lot, you know, they didn't really know what to do with it. So they call it a thousand. Well, so now we literally say, it's exactly a thousand years for this millennial reign. And wow. and that's our, tra- that's an example of tradition. So that's, it, that answers a question I had. I thought, why doesn't the book of Mormon ever mention millennium? And I, I'm making a little list here of things that maybe it'll appear in the next slide if I save it properly, but that this, again, the book of Mormon is spot on because um, I'm sorry, let me see if I can advance my, my slide here. Um, yeah, Enoch's not in there at millennium and it doesn't even mention a thousand years, um, which according to your definition now, it was just sort of a Hebrewism, you know, to, to say a long time. Mm-hmm. And that's good. The, <clears throat> what a great example, guys. This, this is men, right? Men are sitting down, giving their best efforts to translate languages. And then we have it in a book called the Bible as opposed to a boy sitting down with instruments from God placed over his eyes to translate language using the perfect words for today's language to bring light by the power of God. And 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 notice too, I was just going to say, and Moroni adds, and we know of no fault. We don't have, we don't know any faults in that record. But shame on you forever trying to lift up the work of the Book of Mormon as being more reliable than the work of, translators over the years all right that's that's just a no-no and and really it's it's really something to weigh on our heart people as we look at the great gift of the book of mormon um its source and the power with which it came yeah that is powerful i i've realized too and i'm going to admit this a little bit later in the powerpoint or maybe it's going to be in the next episode but I've had to reconsider things that I've taught just even the last couple of years, because I I still had this blend of things that, Oh, I'm learning stuff from the book of Mormon, but I still had these notions that I wasn't separating at all because it seemed right. Another word that you don't ever find in the book of Mormon is this idea of prison house of, and and, in this idea that, Oh, well, if you're not okay here, you go to this prison house and you get to think about it, you know, it's after you die, but then you get another chance and then you come back and everyone's judged. The Book of Mormon teaches something a lot more plainly. It, it never mentions prison house, and it does it in this regard. We are given a life here to make our decision. And if we make our decision, the second death doesn't have power over us. You know, But people who don't know God's gospel, they're given eternal life by Jesus or, or this chance to be resurrected. I... I don't think if there's a second judgment after this term prison house, it's it's not meant for wishy-washy people at all, if it even exists. And I'm not sure that it does, because in the Book of Mormon, it's never explained that way. But I, I taught it that way. 
And, and I realized that my teachings of that partly were influenced by these ideas of Enoch that came in. And so I, I'm just looking back at all that and, and now thinking, you know what? It's, it's safer, it's clearer just to stay with the Book of Mormon. And I know it would offend a lot of people in the Restoration, but it, a prison house concept isn't part of its teaching. These ideas were, were added later, and I'm not saying added by Joseph Smith. This whole idea of Enoch came in by uh, kind of by the back door. You know, there's this one mention of Enoch in Genesis that he walked with God. And then suddenly later, a man by the name of James Bruce, who's himself a Freemason, he's an explorer from Scotland, he goes into Africa and he finds in Ethiopia these uh, records called the Kebra Nagast and others. He has them translated and they talk about this guy named Enoch and they find these books of Enoch. Well, those weren't part of the Jewish record. And if you look historically, there's been a lot of debate over the time. The reason the Jews didn't have them is because they really entered in through Christian, the, the Christian influence. In other words, after the time of Christ, by, by people who weren't Jews. And so you have this um, embellishment of stories, which may or may not be true at all, but yet my, my teachings were somehow based on these readings. I felt like, oh, well, it was something Joseph Smith wrote about, so it had to be true. I don't think it necessarily is that way now. Your words yeah, are only... Sorry, go ahead, Sean. Go ahead. Go ahead. Words are only as good as the meanings we give to them. And uh, when we say the word Zion... I picture like this city that was taken up to heaven. I mean, that's my first thought of Zion yeah. and that we are to build Zion like Enoch did. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen uh, recently a, a man put out a thing on Zion and, and they're using all kinds of quotes and things. It's like whenever we see Zion in the Old Testament, we instantly import it into our restoration culture and try to make it fit. And the world knows the word Zion. I mean, the Jews have been called Zionists and it's, the world understanding of that word is completely different from ours. And we have to just consider, well, why is that? Well, because of Genesis and the story that was introduced, um, the rest of the world, it's referring to, you know, the Jews, the, the hill that was Jerusalem was built on Zion. It was just, it was this place, but it's, it's tied into that culture. And for us, it's not, it's not tied in to them. It's, it's a city that was built and we know about it and it's unique to us and we're supposed to be striving to build it so Jesus can return. And that's, so that's, that gets a lot of uh, confusing ideas that don't always mesh together when you're looking at the Zion of the actual uh, record in the Bible. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, Shane, what were you going to say? Oh, um, well just, there's a couple, two things. So Enoch city is actually in the Bible, um, but it's not the Enoch that we all think of. It, it's the I think he's either the son or the grandson of of Cain, and he was yes. extre extremely evil. <laughs> it was like an, yes. an evil, evil city of horribleness, you know. Yeah, um, kind of the, an early version of Sodom, <laughs> you know. Exactly, um, exactly. And then the other point I was going to make is, you know, the brother of Jared was told very clearly by by God. You know, he said, no one has ever had the level of righteousness and humility that you have had. Exactly. And so he sh and so he showed himself to him because of that humility. Well, he came after Enoch. Exactly. And that's another that's another part of this that it's like, you know, even the critics, some of them will point that out. And it's like we as Latter-day Saints have to ask that question, too. Well, was the Book of Mormon wrong or is it possible that this Enoch story isn't what we've really been told? Because we're we're told that Enoch was the greatest, and he had seen these things, and he, you know, he was seven from Adam or something like that. And it's like it's not it's not in the Book of Mormon. It's not told that way. Brother of Jared was the first, and I really truly believe that. I, I don't believe Enoch saw these things. And when you start finding out where the Enoch story comes from, it, it begins to make sense. Well, this, you know. 1830s convinced themselves the kingdom was imminent. Brigham Young taught the millennium was already underway. There were a lot of signposts fulfilled. I think it shows little, literally how little they understood about the Book of Mormon. Instead, they started pursuing things of their own revelations. They mean in the early church. 
you know, Israel was going to gather urgently, or at least so they thought. The early saints had to quickly gather to build Zion, but they're wholesale rejected. Uh, the saints, you know, make this mantra about the RLDS saints, as we pointed out, while this the LDS focus on other things. And so, and I could never figure that out, but I guess it just depends on which man you followed. So when, when we look at the Book of Mormon, again, the Book of Mormon is brought to us, not as we say, it wasn't that, oh, well, God needed to restore his church. So he, he did this and, and now the church is restored. It was different. He wanted to show mercy upon the Gentiles so we wouldn't stumble at the doctrine the way we had been stumbling. And so the Book of Mormon comes to us so we won't stumble. And what is the prophecy of the Book of Mormon? That we Gentiles will reject God, you know, just like everyone else did, Nephites, Lamanites, Jews. And what's more is that because we had it made so easy for us is that the Gentiles experience the fierce anger of God. This is the worst judgment to suffer. This is out of 3 Nephi 9. Uh, these are some scriptures we've shared before, but it's like two different stories. It's the tale of two cities. In our churches, we're telling the story about, oh, God's going to bless us, and we're his chosen people, and all these things. And yet, you read the Book of Mormon, and it's about how judgment is going to come upon these people who receive the Book of Mormon and deny God and reject him. And it's like, how do these two reconcile? They, they don't. So it's like either we close our eyes to the Book of Mormon and we keep just telling the story of Enoch City returning, but but it's not in the Book of Mormon, and, and we have to learn from that. Before you go on, I, I want to share this just because I can see. Uh, I want to play a little bit opposite here. Uh, this is in Hebrews. This is the chapter on faith in Hebrews. But Enoch is mentioned in the New Testament. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So there's this little nugget here that gives us just enough um, information that what I've seen happen over and over again is that then in the restoration culture, we have uh, we build a framework around that to turn it into something. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, that is there, but Enoch's not, the first, I mean, wasn't it Elijah or Elijah taken away to heaven? This Edith being translated, not seeing death, is not the only time we read this in the scriptures that a man did that. But that's the extent of the commentary in the New Testament on Enoch. Exactly. And so we, we get these two stories, you know, that the Gentile writings expand on Enoch's return. And we have to kind of question where that comes from. Book of Mormon doesn't mention it. The Gentile writings overshadow the teachings of the Book of Mormon. And so this everlasting covenant we mentioned is the Gentiles teach it's this thing made with Enoch, and it's about you know the posterity of Noah. The Book of Mormon teaches that the everlasting covenant was, was with Abraham, and it was to kind of rejoin the Jews and regather the house of Israel. Two vastly different stories. And, and again, you know, we we all we collectively in the church know this story about the everlasting covenant and it's like we don't consider this story the one that the book of mormon teaches about you know another another one that uh, about the everlasting covenant that joseph added was uh to the bible he added in uh, the old testament i think it's in deuteronomy or or it may, it may not have been, maybe exodus but anyway um the, the plate or the tablets that Moses took from the mount, he said that written on those was the everlasting uh, covenant of the Melchizedek priesthood. Uh huh. And that was added to the, to the inspired version or the Joseph Smith translation. Yeah, that's a good point because then we go down these rabbit holes of priesthood and priesthood authority and when it was restored and who has it and all these things. And none of it was part of the original writing. And if we come back to the Book of Mormon, it beautifully dovetails, or it should, into our mind of what we should be emphasizing. And, you know, Melchizedek priesthood is never mentioned in the Book of Mormon. Melchizedek is, but ne never an order of God after his name, after the name Melchizedek. Right. So, but know. to call it the everlasting covenant, you know, it, it it's like we have all these everlasting covenants and they all right, do different right. things. You know? and, and, and that's a good point, actually, is that we again you know mike you know the song i knew genesis 9 by heart in the inspired version because we were taught to believe there really was only one everlasting covenant and 
there were more everlasting simply just meant it was like God's name being everlasting. That was this covenant with God. It was something special and it would persist through time. Well, all covenants were supposed to persist through time. And there were a lot of them. Um, I, I made a list somewhere. I don't think I have it here of, of different places where the, the Bible talks about everlasting covenant. I mean, I suppose we could just search it and find it, but the, to the restorationists, there was only one, and it was a special one we were given to believe about Enoch. But if you have the Book of Mormon, you don't get the Enoch version. You get something more powerful, and that's the promise made with Abraham. So, And the, the LDS, uh, the everlasting covenant to, to most of the LDS that I've talked to is more about a marriage, eternal you know, rest, um, uh, celestial, celestial marriage. Um, I asked about, I asked one of my Mormon friends about that and they, they didn't, they knew the Enoch story, but when, when I say everlasting covenant, that's not what they were thinking. They were thinking marriage and sealed in the temple and you know, that, that tradition that they started. Interesting. Yeah. That see, and it just goes in every direction based on the traditions you taught. This is why it's like, we have to come back and say, okay, what does the word actually say? You know, the book of Mormon, it, it doesn't tell that the Gentiles are going to orchestrate the building of Zion, you know, especially on someone else's covenant land. This land was given to be Joseph's land and and whoever God would bring here. So he, he brought us here, Gentiles, gives us every opportunity, but we're still occupying their land. You know, we're, we're the guests. So it probably wouldn't be up to the guests to build a house on the land. It might be the owner's privilege to build it, which is what the Book of Mormon teaches. The new Jerusalem will be built by the remnant of Joseph. But instead, we presume that's our responsibility. And the Book of Mormon instead tells that Gentiles seeking Zion would have the Holy Ghost. Now, we see this abundantly. I mean, there were gifts of healing and different manifestations. Not all the manifestations were of God. We even find them writing in the Book of Mormon. Ah, oh, that, that speaking in tongues thing, that was of the devil, you know. And so they over time became aware that they could be deceived. But when the Book of Mormon talks about seeking Zion, it's the same Zion that it talks about when it's talking about fighting against Zion. It's not talking about a physical city and independence. It's talking about the promises of God to regather his people. You know, Hamas is fighting against Zion is, as we speak, right? Fighting against the holy people and their covenant land. There's, there's definitely evil behind that force. It's the same evil that motivated Adolf Hitler and others. But when we seek Zion, we've been conditioned to think, oh, well, that's, you know, gathering independence. That's making sure that we build this city. We have no clue how to do it, by the way. But we keep thinking if we talk about it long enough, it's going to magically appear. S seeking Zion isn't that. Seeking Zion is seeking that God's covenants be fulfilled with his people. There will be or a physical city, but it's built by Joseph. Yeah, go ahead. Well, we had an episode, I think, when you came back on here, this last batch of uh, videos we've done about, we did one on what does it mean to fight against Zion. It's what you just right. said, and restate that. It's it's uh, changing the message of the covenants that God made with Israel into something different. So, you know, you have on a physical scale Hamas fighting against the covenant people, trying to get back land that God has already stated would be given to a certain group of people. But on a spiritual level, it's not um not telling the story or 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 blending the story of god's work with his covenant people into something different and that's uh you know that's just as bad on the spiritual level i think i agree i agree you know this um the promise to the gentiles would be a covenant with jesus just like the promise to the jews is but the Book of Mormon teaches that the gospel would come from the Gentiles to the remnant. And we, we want to believe that that's done by the power of God in us, and it's done in a peaceable way. But when we read 3 Nephi 7, a scripture that we've shared in times past, Jesus says, I'm going to take the gospel from among you when you reject it, and I'm going to return it to you, O house of Israel. Um, <clears throat> and that seems to be something that Jesus does personally. And so... I I don't know. I just feel like, man, the clock's been ticking for us, and we keep thinking that somehow, oh, God's just waiting to, you know, we tell ourselves God's waiting to put the church in order, and then all these things are going to happen. It's like the Book of Mormon never touches a subject like that. 
It's not about the Gentiles having a righteous church and then Zion appears. Nothing even close to that. Instead, the Book of Mormon teaches that the gospel returns to the remnant. And when it returns to the remnant, they increase their understanding of Christ. They understand who they are. They, they seek Christ and have a righteous relationship with him, which has been the point of the gospel all along. And then from there, the remnant builds a holy city, the remnant of those converted to Christ. Um, yeah. Anyhow, yeah. I just, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, it's like we've, it's like we've been lulled to sleep. You know, we have this checklist of things, you know, if I, if I gather at independence and I attend church on, on Wednesday and Sunday morning and Sunday night, and I, you know, you kind of have this checklist of things, you know, and you think, well, I'm, I'm here, I'm gathered in the, in the in independence. I've got my storehouse. I'm, you know, I'm regularly going to church. I, I, you know, I'm teaching my children, you know, the gospel, which to me, the gospel would be, you know, Zion and the gathering. And, you know, that's, that's the gospel that we've taught, you know, and instead of teaching about Christ, you know, and having that and establishing that relationship with him, but it's like, you tell yourself, well, this, that's what righteousness is. Mm -hmm. I, I'm righteous. You know, the LDS, you know, they have a different checklist, you know, temple ordinances and, and the baptism for the dead yeah. and, and all that. But it's all just a checklist. And once we do that checklist, then we feel like we're righteous, you know, and I think you put your guard down. You know, you feel it's like you're waiting. You're like you're waiting at a, a train station for a train to come. You know, Zion will come eventually and I'm ready. You know, whenever it shows up, will be great. You know, and it, it, you completely miss out on the relationship that you could have on a day to day basis with Christ. When you put away tradition and you just say, here I am, Lord, I'm an empty vessel. What do you want to teach me? I yeah. just read yesterday, Shane, a, a lady, uh, LDS lady, sharing the exact same thing in the LDS culture. She said, my dad thinks that, you know, my dad says, I've, I've see, I'm going to be in the celestial kingdom. I've got my temple recommend. Everything's good. And she says, it's nothing about righteousness. He, she, he treats my mom terribly in day-to-day -day activities. But he's so sure that uh, because he's done this list of things and holds his temple recommend in good standing that, that he's in the celestial kingdom and he's, he's just waiting for it to happen. And she was sharing this and it's exactly what you said in, in, in each culture, we have what we think we're doing is right. But if we're not loving each other in our circle of people more and more in our hearts are more and more being drawn out to our fellow humans, then we're off in some place that, because that's the power of the gospel is to love each other. Like Jesus loved us. Yeah, to all that, it, the only way we could have done that is if we transfigured God's word somehow. And that word became, that transfigured word became more important to us than the written word. And and so when, when we look at what's ahead, there's a rude awakening. I mean, the Restoration Gentiles meet to discuss Zion, thinking we're God's people, while the Book of Mormon is predicting that the Gentiles will reject God. And there's a stern warning to us. And so, you know, how can we be so opposed well, here's probably a good place for us to bring up third knee, or I'm sorry, Ether six, Mike. I think you've got that to share. Um, we're going to come back to these scriptures probably at another time, but I, I want right now just to, like you pointed out early on, Shane, it's it's more important to teach what the truth is versus what is you know the, the issues that we're facing. And when Moroni shares the brother of Jared's story he he says something pretty important here and, and it's like you know moroni I, and now i moroni I proceed to finish my record concerning the destruction of the people of whom i have been writing for behold they rejected all the words of ether now just pause there for a minute and you think here's a guy totally righteous of god and everyone rejects all of his words and that's a that's a situation where i mean you know you just share a little bit in a restoration group that oh man ether might not be true and what was it Mike, you know, you had dinner with a couple of prominent elders recently, and they're like, don't say that in our restoration churches. You know, they'll run you out if you mention something like that. Well, right. he, Ether was the same way. He, he truly told them of all things from the beginning, a man that after the waters had receded. Now, this is where I want to make my first point about Enoch and Enoch City. That after the waters had receded from off the face of this land, it became a choice land above all other lands, a chosen land of the Lord. <clears throat> and notice right there, it doesn't say an Enoch build a city up here. I mean, literally, there are people, I don't know if everyone believes this, but some people think Enoch City was right here where Independence was, and it's going to return exactly to where it took off from. Again, the, these things 
have become folklore. They're, they're scripture to some others, but this is never mentioned in the Book of Mormon. It was a choice land, and wherefore God, the Lord, would have that all men should serve him who dwell upon the face thereof, and that it was the place of the new Jerusalem which should come down out of heaven in the holy sanctuary of the Lord. Behold, Ether saw the days of Christ. Now, this is another term which I love because I, I guess I recognize what the Book of Mormon teaches. It never mentions millennium. It never mentions a thousand years. It doesn't give a time frame, but it says the days of Christ. And Jesus mentions this at least two places I know of in, in 3 Nephi 9 and 3 Nephi 10, where he says, you remnant of Joseph, you're going to become righteous. Your descendants will be, and you're going to build a holy city. And he says, and I will be in the midst. This is parallel to Jacob chapter 3. <coughs> Excuse me. Jacob chapter 3, the parable of the olive tree, where the master of this vineyard works with the servants, right? He's in the midst. And the servants being, you know, his his priesthood or his, his people like, you know, Moroni or Ether that are few but doing the work. Those are the days of Christ, and it's a day to come. Where I was misled also was I believe that when Enoch City returns, that kicks off the millennium, and there's like suddenly, it's never explained, but there's suddenly this world peace, and everyone's at peace for a thousand years. Well, the Book of Mormon teaches something differently. When the master is in the midst, there's still a lot of wild bad fruit on the tree and this fruit these branches need to be removed and it's only as the bad is removed and the good begins to grow that the good overtakes and eventually after a process of time we're not given how much there's all good fruit again but there's a process of time and this is <clears throat> to use our our word this is what the millennium is is about that and this is, but more specifically, this is why Isaiah begins Isaiah chapter two saying, I saw a Zion established in the top of the hills and all the nations flowed unto it to learn of her ways. And it's like, it's obviously a statement about Zion. Jesus is in command, but the nations haven't learned about him yet. How could that be? Well, this is exactly what Jesus has been explaining in a few places in the Book of Mormon is that he returns to our midst. There's no Enoch City returning back at the beginning of the millennium. That's not in the Book of Mormon. But there's Jesus returning, and he says, and the powers of heaven will be in your midst. Now, some people, I'll, I'll concede, could say, well, that could be Enoch City. Yeah, that's true. But it's it's never what he says, and it, it could be a lot more than that. It, it, it could be you know humans that are resurrected. It could be angelic beings. It could be forces that we are totally unaware of right now probably all the above but it's all about jesus doing this work of removing the bad branches and letting the good branches grow so this process of converting the world begins in the days of christ and somehow we've equated that with this zion that we build as we be in these gentiles in the restoration and, and the book of mormon never even mentions the gentiles in this in this scenario it's all about the house of Israel and what they do when they return to Christ. There's another little tidbit I want to throw in here. It's something I learned recently. There's a <clears throat> place that bothered me when in Acts chapter 2, I think when the Holy Ghost comes down and they're all speaking in tongues and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And then is it Peter or someone says, hey, this is like Joel wrote. This, these are the last days. And the Spirit of God is on people. And that bothered me because I thought, how is it that the Spirit of God is on them and it's the last days? I mean, we've been living for over 2,000 years since then, right? And so how would that have been the last days? But what the Book of Mormon teaches, and this is just a little tidbit, but it explains something. It states in the days of the Gentiles or in the in the last days, it, it's... I'm sorry, it, it back up. It says, in the last days or in the days of the Gentiles. In other words, it's equating a Hebrewism, which Hebrewism is the last days, with the Gentiles. Why I'm sharing this is because 
we always assumed that last meant, okay, it's the final countdown of the days. But last days simply meant the first shall be last and the last shall be first. The time when the gospel goes back to the Gentiles. That's exactly what was mentioned in Acts chapter 2. Okay, we're, we're calling it the last days, but we know that to mean the days when the gospel goes back to the Gentiles. How long that lasts? Well, it's lasted up through our day, but we aren't the end of the story. The story continues when the gospel returns to the house of Israel. And even though those days are later ahead, that isn't technically last days. In other words, last days just means when the gospel is given to the Gentiles and they, quote, have dominion. So this was one of the things that tripped up Joseph Smith and all the early saints because they believed, hey, the gospels come to us in the last days, like the scripture says, there's only a few days left. That wasn't actually what it meant or what it was intended. I think it was the Hebrewism that simply meant the Gentiles are the ones who have power over the gospel right now, dominion over it. Any yeah, else? there's yeah, there's something that we don't we don't really focus on in the restoration that much, and that is that the this new covenant that that God made with man, you know, through Christ. And though, you know, with Christ dying and then giving us his spirit, you know, he is among us. He told them at the, that time in Jerusalem, he said, my kingdom is at hand. You know, he won that battle over Satan and his kingdom was established, you know, and I, but we, we tend to, you know, sort of start everything at 1830. You know, we sort of kind of ignore what really, how, how massive of an event that was for his, his death and resurrection. And right. I think that was the final phase of his plan was that new covenant that he established and we're still under it and we're still full of, we still have his spirit with us. I mean, nothing's changed. He is still King and he still has won the battle or, you know, and he's going to win the war. And I think we, we tend to downplay that because of our traditions. Yeah. And, and again, those traditions led us to believe that somehow building Zion was, was imminent. And, and that's why we had to gather to independence so urgently, but we misunderstood several of the signposts. And I know we've talked about the signposts before, but um, anyhow, I don't know. How, how are we doing on time, Mike? Well, there we should probably wrap, wrap up for this. It was, it was just supposed to be an intro, uh, yeah. but we've, of course, had some good conversation. Corey, tell us what going forward, what's, what's your ideas uh, for the future episode of this Tale of Two Cities? Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you. I'd like to continue to read through this Ether 6 or it's Ether 13 in the LDS because it lays down the real new Jerusalem, the real city, the thing that we call Zion. It talks about who builds it. It, it also talks about this idea that the old Jerusalem is going to become inhabited of people. And it, and it takes us through the end of time, literally, um, when there's a new heaven and a new earth. And it talks about these cities, and I, and I hope I'm not misunderstanding this, per persisting in, into a new heaven and new earth when all things are made new. I don't understand what that means, but we'll talk about it. So, from there, I'd also like to include some of these scriptures that I gave in the list before, 2 Nephi 11, and, and some of the things written in uh, 3 Nephi, spoken by Jesus, that compare this idea of Zion and the city built to the remnant, not a city built by restorationists. So, and why do you think... <clears throat> why, why will this... Why do you think this is of value? Why are we spending time on this? Why... Um, what, what does this do for, quote, our people or those we share our life with or our, our traditions, our churches we go to? Yeah, I think the, for me, this begins to separate the truth from the tradition. And if we see truth, we can be more effective for Christ. Um, I, I like how you pointed this out before when, in our conversation that despite the false traditions that seem to surround us, and we don't, the biggest problem with that is we don't recognize their traditions around us that in spite of that, his arm is still stretched out to us. You know, he, he hasn't retracted the promise of eternal life to us. We haven't exhausted his patience. And I, I imagine this is an ever recurring theme among anyone who comes to Christ is that we come to Christ and we bring some false notions, some untruths, and it's offensive to anyone who thinks they've come to Christ to be told, and you know what, you don't believe this and this and this correctly. Um, but don't worry, it's okay. It's almost like Jesus is saying, hey, it's really not a test over how well you understand my doctrine, which all these things fall under the umbrella of doctrine. It's about 
has your heart changed and have you come back to Christ? That's what judgment's going to be about. So we hopefully we can establish that judgment isn't going to be about how well you understand Zion. I know the things we're going to share are going to be seemingly controversial to people, and it's not intended to be. It's simply, what does the Book of Mormon say? What does it not say? So we'll get in much deeper with what the Book of Mormon says. And I also want to share a little bit more of where the story of Enoch was derived from. It has roots and things that aren't the restoration. Shane, you got anything? Why you find it valuable? Yeah, I mean, I, I for me, this whole journey over the past <clears throat> couple of years has has really highlighted to me that that I, I'm not the authority on on who God is, you know. And I think, and I'm not saying that I thought I was before, but realizing that I have all these false notions of his plan and who he is and, and all that realizing that has made me sort of have to just humbly step back from all of it and say, okay, you know, sort of dismantle it and say, okay, what is truth? What isn't truth? And where is Christ in all of this? You know, and, and it's caused me to really search him out. You know, I've um, in more prayer, more fasting, all those kind of things so that I can know him better. Cause if you know him, he'll shine light on everything that we need to, that we need to know. Um, I think that's a really good point you made, Corey, and that it's really not about what you know. It's about who you know. And have, having that relationship <clears throat> is, really, is really everything. And I, I hope that we're not causing people to doubt or causing people to you know, want to just walk away, but rather encourage people to say, hey, maybe what we've been doing all these years ha has not been drawing us closer to him. And you know, what do I need to do in my life to draw near him, to truly come unto Christ and not just know about him. That's right. the, yeah. And, and I would just say my little piece, that's exactly what we've been doing all these years. Hasn't been drawing us uh, closer to Christ, which is the goal. I find that as I've studied this personally, I find good fruit in my life. I don't, I don't have, there's a, in our culture, it's this constant, Let's go to the Lord. Let's seek his will. Let's have him speak through a man. Let's have him give us where we're at. And it's always a message such as, you know, you're failing, but I'm still merciful. Uh, you know, come together and I will give you instruction on how to do this and what to do next. And we get information sent out that, you know, we're meeting together. And as this meeting goes, so goes the church, you know. So brothers, humble yourselves so that we can lead the church in the right way. And all of that to me doesn't matter anymore because, I realize there's a bigger plan and God's got it in his hands. So I don't have this constant failure being pushed upon me that being beaten down as members of the restoration, failing to build Zion because it's not our task, the the way it's been taught. And so there's not that pressure. And I've, I felt free to just seek out my Lord and not uh, be bombarded with how I'm failing in the organization I belong to. And that's been such good fruit for me. Amen. I agree. I agree. It's been good for me too. And I, I think for some people, gosh, if we somehow uh, assail Zion or the notion that we've had about Zion, it's kind of like the final straw or we've pulled the rug out from everyone. And it's like, it's not that at all. I just want people to see, hey, what was the truth that Jesus actually taught? What does he want us to focus on? And it's it's like you mentioned, both of you, you know, it's it's our relationship with him that becomes more powerful. And in that, these prophecies are going to play out. They're playing out right now in time. We'll be able to recognize them more easily because I think our minds will be clear. And this topic of the, this tale of two Zions, this topic because of my paradigm of how I was taught and what I was taught has become one of the hardest things, in my opinion, for me to be able to let go of. And I, and I feel a little stronger every day when I'm reading, man, the word is really refreshing. It's really powerful. It tells promises that I never considered because I always saw it a different way. And so I'm, I'm excited about that. And I hope other people can be too. That's perfect. That's the, when you read the scriptures, it's refreshing, but when I fall into tradition, it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. uh, it, when, when tradition is substituted for scripture, it's frustrating. And the word of God uh, shouldn't frustrate us. It should um, bring us hope and clarity and truth and light and all of those things that he is very good. Oh, well, go yeah, ahead. And I, I think it, I think this needs to bring us to a, a state of repentance. I mean, we have allowed an institution, we've allowed an instant, a man-made institution to stand between us and our relationship with Christ. Right. You know, we, we rely on this institution to tell us what to believe, 
you know, and, uh, you know, and, and I, and the institution itself, you know, the animal itself believes that it should be that, you know, I've had, I've had people c- contact me or, you know, my, I have had an old pastor contact me that, uh, of a branch I attended, you know, and, and basically, you know, you could tell he was treating me like I was in the apostate box, you know, that I was, that I was, you know, no longer in, you know, in fellowship. And, you know, it, there was a real str- and it wasn't like he said anything hateful, but there was just a feeling of real judgment there. It wasn't like two brothers just talking. We're all, you know, we're not just walking each other home. You know, yeah. it, it was, it was, it was this man who set himself as above me and ready to place me in the apostate box. You know, and I, I think I go back to think of like, um, you know, David Whitmer, you know, and, and I, of course we, none of us were there at the time, but the accusations that were brought up against him were he, you know, didn't support Joseph Smith. He, you know, was willing to, qu- he, he questioned some things that were being done and he didn't keep the word of wisdom. And those were reasons to disfellowship him. And he was threatened. He felt like he had, he felt his life was in danger. He had to move away. Where's the love of Christ in any of that? Yep. You know, and I think we, I think we let the institution become our religion instead of letting Christ be the center of everything. And then the fruit of that is us meeting together and fellowshipping and all the things that we do together in a, in a church environment. We make the church the center and Christ is just another part of the doctrine. Yeah. And if the church is strong, well, you can kind of sell that to other people. But I, I never felt strong in that. It's like I never had a church example to really show people. But now I feel like I can read the Word of God in a I, and I just feel like through the Book of Mormon, it's it's taught me what the true eternal principles are, and I can share those freely. And I and I don't need an institution as the example for that. It's like I can see the love, I can feel the love, I can I can point other people to the love of Christ, and and that that is what Christ has wanted from the beginning. You know, the institution has a purpose and a place, but we. We haven't created an institution that's at all set up like the Nephite church, for instance, when they were righteous. You know, we're far from that. And, and yeah. what all we know is what we know. But what Jesus has to offer is still something different. Yeah. Well, we'll reconvene back here and carry on with the tale of two cities, the tale of two Zions. Um, thank you, Corey, Shane. Thank you. Thanks, it was Mike. nice having, having us all together for the first time. I like this. Okay. Yeah, it's great. Forward to it again. All right, Corey, take us out. Hey, just remember, we are much more than three brothers. We're a, a world of people who just want to walk each other home. Amen. God bless. Yeah. Take care. Take care.